Is this audio coming through? <clears throat> yes, it is, Angela. Or bottom. Yep. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So I've got uh, 2.15. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final session of the Army University's 2022 Learning Symposium. And in my humble opinion, we've saved the best for last. Uh, for the next hour, we'll be discussing innovations and in developing creativity in the Army profession using the methods of Professor Angus Fletcher of The Ohio State University and the collaborative research with Dr. Fletcher at CGSC this upcoming year. This panel will seek to answer some of the questions uh, about how we develop creativity and how essential it is uh, to the Army enterprise in multi-domain operations. Our panel features Dr. Ken Long, Associate Professor of Sustainment and Force Management, CGSC, Dr. Rich McConnell, the Project Lead and Associate Professor of Tactics here at CGSC, Dr. Major Angela Samerson, Army Nurse and PhD and Chief of the Clinical Research Support Division at the Army Institute of Surgical Research. Lieutenant Colonel Retired Autumn Liveridge, Professor of Practice at Texas A&M, and Dr. Angus Fletcher, a practitioner of story science, the youngest professor at the Ohio State University. Dr. Fletcher has dual degrees in neuroscience and literature, and his research employs a mix of laboratory experiment, literary history, rhetorical history, and to explore the psychological effects, cognitive behavioral therapeutic of different narrative technologies. Dr. McConnell. Thank you. Um, I would love to start our dialogue today uh, with the tale of the big jam, a creativity study or, or story from earlier this year in the spring of this uh, year when everyone was surprised when Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, this was a group of people who had been sort of high school friends, uh, you know, prior to 2010, uh, had a little uh, club playing with drones and they uh, went off to places like Oxford, Cambridge, Sorbonne, and came back to Ukraine just in time to see Russia take over uh, the Crimean, uh, you know, and so they, and they were concerned. They said, you know, hey, we could probably help. Um, we, we think that drones are going to be the next big thing, uh, and we could probably help. We don't think the Russians are done, so they're probably coming back. So let's do something about this. Uh, and they said, well, that's a great idea. The MOD were, would be happy to use you guys, but we just can't afford you. We don't have the budget. They said, no problem. They proceed to crowdsource themselves. Uh, they basically have the equivalent of a GoFundMe that they, they then fund them, themselves, build a $800 uh, octocopter uh, that was, you know, that's not very much in the field of uh, defense acquisition. And they uh, start playing with this, and they start looking at something uh, that some of us who who have been to Afghanistan and Iraq remember. It's called an RK, RKG-3. It's an anti-armor grenade. It looks like the old German uh, potato masher, and it has a little drogue chute in the handle. And the idea was you threw this thing above the tank, and it would then stabilize for downward flight, putting a shape charge on the top of a tank. Well, they mass produced these things, Russia did. And they end up realizing that's not a great idea to try to low crawl up on a tank. And so they come up with the rocket propelled grenade. Meanwhile, these things are everywhere. They're inexpensive. And so these uh, folks, they go, hey, I think we can put them. They discover they can put about two of these things underneath their octocopter. But that's not enough because they're like the drone chute is going to get stuck in the in the rotors. So what do we do about that? Well, they decide to 3D print 
uh, these little fins that make it not look like a miniature little bomb. And uh, so they then said, that's really cool, but what else can we do? And as you can see in this Guardian article, it'll tell you that uh, they um, use the Starlink, available supplied by Elon Musk, to network these drones. So now every drone that's in the air, it speaks to all the other drones. And they're like a swarm. And they create a digital map so that Ukrainian leaders can see Russian troop movements in real time. And the effect of this was to create something that our doctrine calls exceptional information, that it's the information the Russians hadn't planned on and surprised them. And so this is really what we're trying to, to examine here in this study. Uh, we're interested in creativity. Uh, we wanna see if we can find, a, help people be able to identify exceptional information, that is stuff that you didn't expect, uh, either threats or opportunities. Uh, and that requires imagination, which is a, a form of creativity to imagine future states. And so that's really what this is about. And you can see the diversity uh, of our team. So uh, if you could give the next slide, this is the diversity of our team. Uh, and we, there's nine of us. Uh, I'm the principal investigator for this, uh, this uh, project. Um, and uh, you've got us on a different slide deck, but okay. There, okay. So uh, Jared, Lieutenant Colonel Jared Kites in the Department of Command Leadership. Uh, and you heard where Angela's from. And by the way, Angela, uh, wrote a rather uh, interesting uh, MMAS thesis when she was here as a student, examining creative thinking instruction at the War College, which got a lot of attention and was one of the big reasons why she's on this team. Uh, Ryan Strong is over at the Army Management Staff College. Andrew Schaffner is the, uh, the director of the, de the Department of Command and Leadership. Jake Mong is in DTAC. Ken Long, as you heard, is from DISFIM, and I'm from DTAC. Angus is from OSU, and then Morgan Cornstubble is our math expert who's a former West Point math professor. So it's really kind of the strength of the team is its diversity. Um, and I'll just hand it over to Angus, you're up. <clears throat> well, uh, thanks everyone for hosting me. Can you hear me all right? Yep. So I wanna basically just start by thanking the Army for putting me in this position. People often express incredulity that I am working with the Army. I have no military background. I do not know how to use a firearm. And people often ask me, why are you working with the Army? And I say, because the Army has driven this research. And this is research which outside the Army is now being taken on by top business schools. Um, it's being disseminated through uh, some of the biggest companies, some of the biggest C-suites in America. We have published the research already in leading science journals and in the Harvard Business Review. And that has all come out of CGSC and the Army more broadly because there is this enthusiasm and commitments to what I would broadly call a growth mindset. So what we have done so far, picking off of a uh, uh, Rich's original remarks is we've identified centers in the brain that are not being trained by current creativity training. And when people ask me, well, what is the importance of creativity to the army? I say to them, creativity is not just about coming up with beautiful new artworks. Creativity is about coming up with a second plan. And that's why we've already deployed this training, not just in conventional army. Last week I was out at Robin Sage at USASOC. Um, so frontline teams are using this training now to help them adapt faster to chaotic situations, to emergent threats and opportunities, and come up with second plans. And the two main things that we're really focusing on to piggyback on Rich are one, the identification of exceptional information. This is something that computers cannot do and that computers will never be able to do. It's being able to identify anomalies, things that are strange, things that are unusual and then leverage them to advantage. And the second thing that we focus a lot on is what is technically known as counterfactual thinking or what you might think of as what if thinking. And that's telling yourself a story of the future and then not contending yourself with a single story of the future, but saying, what are all the different ifs? What are all the different scenarios that I can imagine? And coming up with technical ways to tap into the brain's evolved capacity to develop all those different branching scenarios. So I'm going to pass um, I'm going to pass my time now uh, to the next commentator, but I will be here to answer any questions or to talk in any depth uh, about the study that we're now conducting. Okay, so uh, here just a kind of a, uh, Angus is being a little bit humble, right? I mean, 
he uh, published an article in the New York Academy of Sciences about our study and about the theories uh, underpinning it, which uh, the New York Academy of Science has been around since the 19th century. And it's, this article is now the second most read article in the history of the journal. So clearly people are interested in what is this, this uh, approach to creativity. And that's what we're gonna try to talk about a little bit this, this afternoon. Next slide, please. Okay, um, we've got the bios available. Uh, and the other person I'd like to talk about too is a former st student of mine is uh, Dr. Uh, is Autumn Leverage. She's a professor of practice down at Texas A&M's engineering department. And she also saw our protocol and uh, used our pretest that we're using for the experiment. Uh, she used it as part of her mid uh, midterm that she did for students. And we gave her some, some feedback for her students because uh, uh, we're evaluating the uh, creativity of our folks. And I'll show you this in a second based on novelty, i.e. is it new and is it surprising, uh, feasibility, can it work, and suitability, would a commander mm -hmm. worth their salt be willing to attempt this plan? You can have a wonderful creative idea, but if, if no commander is willing to try it, it, it might just be background noise. So the other thing too is that back to the exceptional information thing, here's the deal. We only define it in one place in our doctrine, ADRP 5.0. It's, it's, it's information that the commander known about it during planning, the commander would have uh, made it CCIR and collected against it. I don't think that's a very good uh, definition. I think we could improve on it. We had a better one in the 90s in FM 101-5, which was uh, exceptional information is clues to an impending emergency or an opportunity without which we cannot succeed. And so my point being is, is look, if you can identify exceptional information, you have an advantage over your opponent who may not be able to. If you can identify exceptional information quicker than your opponent, you have an advantage. If you could then turn the table on this exceptional information and inflict exceptional information on your opponent, then you have a definite advantage. And I would argue that's what we're seeing in Ukraine right now in real time. Next slide, please. Yep, yeah, skip through that. Flash through all of the bios. Yes, yeah, flash through the bios. Thank you. Um, there, back there, go back. Okay, so this is the background. Uh, we started this process uh, in May of last year. Uh, we got our uh, protocol approved in December of last year. And then uh, we were intending to actually do data collection in, in, in January at Fort Belvoir, but they, they ended up going virtual due to the COVID. And so we did it in May. Uh, and now we're gonna do another one in August. And if you see the numbers up there, we had two teams in Belvoir, but it's a smaller end. And then we're going to do 10 teams here in August, 640 students, and a total of 80 uh, faculty participants. And so uh, very excited about this. This was briefed to General Martin, who in endorsed it, and General Foley, who's also endorsed it. And if this stuff works, they, uh, the guidance we've received is that um, uh, we will end up promulgating it across Army University. Next slide, please. Okay, so I want to talk about the pilot and just give you our very preliminary uh, findings. Uh, this took place in Fort Belvoir uh, the 9th through the 13th. Myself and Dr. Fletcher were there. Uh, and uh, it was really interesting to kind of watch how this, the students were engaged. So here's the, the preliminary stuff that we've gotten from uh, Morgan Cornstubble. Next. Okay, so what this is, is a couple of the tests, the statistical tests we did. And the bottom line is we have been able to see uh, the test has outperformed the control by a statistically significant extent, which then really would support our hypothesis and answer some of our research questions. So basically to put it in, in, in uh, you know, practical terms, officers in the 50th percentile of creative strategy graduated into the 65th percentile. And basically that's a third of a probable error. So this is also consistent with other uh, studies uh, conducted by uh, Dr. Fletcher in other, in other contexts. Uh, for example, he recently did a study of third graders in Ohio State uh, where they had an increase in 30% of creativity and an increase in resilience, i.e. students that uh, started out willing to give up were 50% uh, of the time and now 100% of the time do not give up at all. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. 
so here's here's a couple of looks at the data. What you have here is uh, the control group is on your left, the test group is on your right. Okay, and basically you can see that we have a Likert scale of one to seven, and as I said earlier, we're looking at novelty, feasibility, suitability. And it, it, this tells an interesting story, right? So both populations are improving their creativity, but it is statistically significantly different in the test group. If you look at the pretest on the top and compare to the post test on the bottom. Now I know it's kind of hard to make out the numbers, but the mean in the, in the pretest is 3.67, I want to say, and the mean down below is 4.32. So this is viewed as statistically significant. Now we can't make elaborate claims on this yet because it was a small n, but we intend to to improve on that here at Fort Leavenworth uh, in August. Uh, next slide. And then this looks specifically at the variables that we're examining. We're looking at novelty, suitability, feasibility. And uh, you can see, again, a very similar trend. Uh, the novelty for the control group was like 3.97. They did improve to a 4.06, but compare that novelty rating to the test group's pretest, which was started out at 3.94 and graduated to 4.56, that's statistically significant. And you can see the same thing for suitability and feasibility. So basically this is encouraging. Uh, the reason we're doing this is not only to try to create the conditions where majors here at CGSC can improve their creativity. Um, the op Officer Professional Military Education Policy that Dr. Kim referred to this morning uh, is that we have not, it not only it talks about, uh, you know, the concern that uh, PME is, is stagnant and that the Malloy reports concern that, that students at, at CGSC are overworked but then under challenged. This would be a, a, a very different way of approaching creativity because I think the guidance that tells us that we are supposed to get the students to demonstrate good critical and creative thinking. I think we do a pretty good job at the critical thinking piece. I think we can definitely improve at getting them to demonstrate creativity. Currently, it's more of a facilitated discussion of creativity. This actually stimulates the portions of the brain that helps you to be more creative. And it seems to be bearing out at this, at this time that this is working. And I will yield back. Next slide. That's, that's the OpMEP uh, guidance right there. And in the slide deck, we have the, the reference slides for you there. Demonstrate Critical and Creative Thinking Skills, signed by General Milley in 2020. Next slide. Um, these are just background. Um, Ken, you're next or no? Yeah, I think uh, I think we'd like to hear from Angela Samosorn. Uh, now, she, her background was as a student last year that uh, studied creativity at the War College in her master's thesis. Also participated in the Future Hunters program with Tradoc G2, where she worked with uh, sci-fi authors and were imagining future states and then using the power of literature and storytelling to make compelling arguments for the possibilities of many different futures. And one of the central features of the Fletcher method is to engage in alternate storytelling and different points of view to trigger those parts of our brain that but we've inherited from the plains of Africa, the storytelling, the what if possibilities that give us a, a uh, an evolutionary advantage. Uh, we neglect some of that in our effort to be uh, analytical. And so this engaging the artful circuits of storytelling in our brain uh, triggers natural skills of creativity that we all have. Central to Fletcher's thesis is that we are tapping into parts of the brain and skill sets that everybody has already, that we're not inventing some new treatment, that we are really unleashing the latent potential that we have. So, uh, Angela, when you're ready, uh, save me and tell me about uh, your experience with creativity and doctrine and in your uh, field adventure. Can you bring up her bio slide, please? Yes. Sure. Um, so, what I found with the thesis writing, you know, asking, um, I really focused on the instructors at the War College because I was wondering how creativity is uh, manifested in the curriculum. You know, if we're supposed to have those the highest strategic thinkers um, in the army in this case, um, 
with an ability to think strategically, think creatively and foster that environment, you know, how is that being generated in the curriculum? And you know, what I found was truly it wasn't, it was kind of like pockets of excellence happening across the institution. Um, so if it was important to the instructor, it became a piece of how they, they just, fun they functioned in their classroom. Um, so there's no true measure of, of creativity, of creative output, which is why I think this, this, um, study that we're doing at CGSC is unique in that, you know, the military loves measurement and we love to quantify things. And so how do you actually show that there was a marked improvement when creativity is viewed sometimes as squishy? So um, I think that there's a, a real potential for what we're doing at CGSC to have an impact across the broader uh, enterprise. But as far as the Future Hunters class, that truly was, I think, it was the last class I took at CGSC, as a matter of fact, it kind of ended out my time there and it ended on a high note because I was able to take what I learned um, across the curriculum, you know, through operations and force management and leadership and bring it together uh, in a class that it didn't seem like it would truly fit because I had to write a story. And so um, the, the instructor was able to really bring out in us um, that piece that is sometimes tamped down um, in other areas of our of our military life, um, you know, because we're forced into thinking about doctrine and, you know, truly creativity it includes doctrine. You still have to have domain relevance in order for your outputs to be viewed as um, uh, creative and useful because being useful is part of, of creativity. And so um, I was pleasantly surprised at how um, truly that one class was able to bring everything together in such a way that I couldn't imagine. Um, and then, you know, allowing me to, to continue on with the work of, of creativity with this, with this team. So does that kind of get at what you were after or was there something else you wanted me to highlight? You, uh, I want to turn it over to Autumn here to let, have her discuss her experience down at A&M, but I want to highlight what Angela but said was like, Angela said was how quickly the uh, Fletcher treatment, the, uh, uh, Fletcher treatment uh, whether we're talking about my soccer camp for youth in the morning, working with special operators, working with uh, uh, SWAT teams in Denmark's equivalent of the FBI, whoever you're working with when you're trying these techniques on a storytelling and narrative inquiry and literature, it, it triggers right away. And in a, a few short hours, you're making significant changes in in the way their thought processes are working and their orientation towards uh, resistance or problem solving. They just keep going. So the immediate return on investment uh, is what really comes out of this uh, study, which is why I'm not surprised to see a statistically significant difference after only a two hour treatment in the various classrooms where we've tried that. Now, uh, if you could call up Autumn's uh, bio there, and then Autumn, if you could talk to us about your experience with very little prep. Sure. Um, so I uh, started teaching this semester, um, my first semester teaching, um, and in the College of Engineering, in the Construction Engineering and Management, and the course was Construction Project Management. It is an upper level course, uh, so it's a 300 level juniors and seniors uh, in the course. And uh, for one section, it's about 70 students. Um, now, civil engineering, certainly much larger than other engineering disciplines. Um, but I was kind of surprised that there would be so many students in an upper level course, you know, as opposed to that might be more common uh, in, a, in a lower level. And so as I went through the course, you know, construction project management, project management, dealing with all kinds of different contractors and subcontractors and things that can go wrong. Y'all may have heard about the bridge collapse in Pittsburgh uh, earlier this year in January. Um, things that can go wrong. And how do we think outside of the box to help, help try to prevent some of those? So of course, from my military background, you know, I ask them, what do you guys think? What do you, you know, what do you think about what's going on in the world? And, you know, it's like crickets, uh, you know, uh, almost felt like a freshman class rather than an upper level class. 
And so when we got to the midterm and, and um, uh, Dr. McConnell had, had sent me, you know, all of his stuff that, that he was working on with the team. And uh, I read through this and I thought, wow, I thought I could very clearly correlate, um, you know, replace out military officer and put in engineer, project engineer, senior project manager, site superintendent, et cetera. Uh, in the construction and the civil engineering field. The tenets of a professional engineer is safety and efficacy. We continuously see uh, uh, problems um, in, in failures in safety and efficacy. And so, you know, what is this? So I took, uh, I took um, Dr. McConnell's, uh, his, his, you know, dialogue boxes, his prompts, um, and I modified those with the same background. Hey, uh, what would you what would you consider? How would you incorporate uh, an AI, you know, into an AI robot into your daily activities? And instead of as as a military officer, it was as a construction project manager. Um, and put this on the midterm exam as an extra credit. So you know they did not you know, have to answer it, but they could, you know, if, if they answered it at all, they at least got some partial credit. Um, but qualitatively, taking a look at their responses, um, you know, I, I really felt that for upper level undergraduate students, they need to be thinking more. Um, and how do we get these to thinking more? So, you know, I think for the future that it's something that, um, you know, maybe to stylize more on having you know, a test group, control group, and more formalized, uh, but to, to then look, hey, is there, you know, can we replicate the statistical significance uh, that, you know, y'all have seen uh, with the CGSC program? Um, I thought that the AI prompt was very interesting uh, because it came up in several different meetings uh, that I attended there on campus. Um, in the College of Engineering, there is also uh, an engineering project management minor, if you're an undergrad, certificate, if you're a graduate student, uh, that you can get. And as we were partnering with some of the different industry reps, um, they brought up the AI piece. And then, you know, it kind of, as I looked at and reflected upon the students' responses, they didn't seem to be aware of the AI that is already in existence. Um, and, you know, I, I, I truly kind of felt um, that reflected in my own experiences as, you know, things that I had worked through and projects that I had worked through in the Army. Um, you know, as I had left the Army and then I'm now transitioning into a, a different environment, you know, academia, but, you know, also industrial, and corporate, um, I, I didn't feel that I was as prepared. I didn't feel, you know, I kind of felt that I was more behind in understanding. Um, I did not have an opportunity to take the future hunters class that Angela had mentioned. Um, I don't know if they had it in 2014, 2015. Um, but, you know, I think that there's, you know, certainly a lot. Um, and the other piece that I'll say is that as I read Angus's uh, FM guide or, or field manual, yeah, guide. Um, I just was really, really drawn to his prompts. And again, I know he had it from a military lens, um, but I could see those same questions and the same kind of guide uh, being developed uh, from an engineering point of view. So I'll pause uh, to turn over for comment for question, but those were some of my initial observations. Uh, a few points. Almost instant teachability here. Uh, what you all you really need are to have the kinds of emergent problems or opportunities that always surprise us in the world where we actually need a creative response, multiple creative responses in order to have robust solutions. And then what to do with that creativity once it emerges is another issue associated with emotional intelligence, collaborative learning, group decision making. It's not enough to just be creative. A profession also has to be grounded in standards and applicability 
because we're managing risk for society. But certainly, creativity on the front end is part of that supply chain that gets you to solutions. And that's a logistician speaking to you there. Um, I also want to say how quickly and easily she was able to adapt the courseware to her unique circumstances. For those of you in radio land out there in PME, uh, we are absolutely eager to work with you to help adapt these insights into whatever your circumstances are. And as I mentioned before, if you can go to slide 25, the tale of two books, uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the footprints of Angus's work and, and our outreach. So uh, the book on the left is a beautifully written 350 page bestseller by Angus that talks about the 25 greatest inventions of literature, uh, literature in human history that nobody will read because it's so massive and beautiful. I don't want to bend the pages. And I asked him to write a small handbook of 30 chapters with bite-sized triggers and a few experiential learning exercises that we could use to engage creativity in the classroom. He said he thought he could do that. He wrote it over the weekend, and it's now... Uh, on Amazon for a couple bucks on Kindle. It's a bestseller already, and it's the number one rated leadership development book on Amazon. And he's gifted it to us, and we'll distribute it to you by PDF only if you promise to use it. And Army University has 200,000 students a year and 7,000 faculty. And what that book contains is 30 bite-sized experiential learning exercises that you can use in less than 30 minutes wherever you are. It's a throwback to the old hip pocket training. Uh, it is powerful and it works with fourth graders, uh, soft officers, the students that Chris Baldwin and I worked with in the elective period last year uh, with the uh, the head of Denmark's FBI, who is a special ops guy, a SWAT guy, a lawyer who represents Denmark in the international anti-terrorism movement, and who's working with Angus and I to turn this material into leadership development for their work. So this has truly a global impact. So that's the tale of two books. Just contact me if you want that book on the right. We'll square you away. Next slide, please. It, it was a series of improbable events that caused this to happen at all. You couldn't even write a movie script that would sell. But one of my students took a course with an MBA teacher at University of Chicago because he was interested in the things that we talked about at CGSC. On the basis of that, plus COVID, we created uh, some Zoom sessions to have strategic thinkers just talk together, civil and military, just to keep from going crazy during COVID. Um, Greg Bunch at Chicago found out I was interested in narrative inquiry and organizational storytelling. He said, hey, you should talk to my friend Angus Fletcher at Ohio State. I I'm from Michigan, so, but I thought it was my professional duty. Within a year, we are where we are right now as a result of that chance circumstances. Uh, you couldn't predict that. But the outreach includes not only our partnership between Ohio State and CGC faculty, students, and alumni, but also with the True Storytelling Institute and Dr. David Boji, who created the field of organizational storytelling 40 years ago and is still by far the number one most prolific author in that area and my doctoral mentor. So I've linked those two guys together, Angus and David, and fireworks ensued. We're working with Tradoc G2's Future Hunters in order to get these ideas about how to construct possible futures out into the intel officers of the world as they're looking at constructing improbable but possible scenarios for developing campaign plans. That's what we need more of when you consider the rate of change in the world. Uh, the Marine Corps, Air University are eating this stuff up with both hands. And uh, fourth graders at Angus's uh, outreach in Ohio and the fourth graders in my soccer summer camp absolutely love this stuff. They are learning to become resilient in that they don't take no for an answer. We give them a problem, they come up with a solution, we say, if that didn't work, what else could you do? And it goes around like popcorn, and those kids love it, and they are amazingly uh, creative, observably creative. Um, Angus is connected with Malcolm Gladwell and Jordan Peterson, thought leaders in the world, and this information is getting out to millions of listeners and Fortune 50 CEOs who are eating this stuff up. Because let me tell you what I think the value of this is to the profession. Somebody asked me the question, why are you bothering doing this? What's in it for the profession? Here's what I think on a conservative basis. 
If you could get a 3% improvement in performance in problem solving by engaging all the leaders with a little more creativity in every transaction they did, you might get a 3% bump in performance. You multiply that by a $1 trillion DOD annual budget, and that's worth $35 billion a year forever, conservatively. And that's if you just get one 3% improvement. Now, you compound that 3% at the rate of innovation. How fast are you doing decisions? How quickly is your cycle time? And you get a 3% bump there? Go ahead and read the book Nudge and figure out what the compound return on investment of incremental improvement is, and math would be involved. That's the conservative estimate. There was, a, there was a major here once upon a time who had an idea for air land battle to replace forward defense. You could argue that forward defense was going to mathematically fail and lead to thermonuclear war and end the world as we know it. But it didn't happen because a four-star general kept that idea alive and implemented it into the force. What was the value of that one creative idea? Well, it turns out to be about $100 quadrillion, which is 50 years of global GDP and all the lives that were not lost. Now, I don't know if he had that idea when he came here. Maybe that idea came to the surface because of this amazing culture that respects innovation and encourages it and multiplies it. Look around, Look around and see the environment that we have. Is it? Or are we only concerned about uh, rigor and critical thinking and application of standards. What are we doing to promote the supply side of creativity? I would just ask you to think about that. Uh, so the return on investment to the profession, astronomical. Go ahead, one more slide. The last thing I want to say before we turn it over to, uh, uh, to questions is the consensual assessment technique is the gold standard in the literature for evaluating creativity in the world. What it says is, since we cannot agree collectively on one true definition of creativity and how to measure it, the next best thing that we can do is ground that judgment in a professional discipline. And so what we've done is, is uh, established a board of independent experts in the profession with diversity, and we're going to evaluate these uh, student solutions on the basis of novelty and suitability, and then feasibility and acceptability. And those are the criteria that we use in our profession to evaluate proposals for change. So uh, we want to respect and employ professional best practices in the judgment of potential solutions. That will help the profession adopt this mentality. So we're using a seven point scale and you can see uh, a, an array there on a two dimensional grid. Uh, what I really want is something that's a seven on novelty and a seven on feasibility and acceptability. And that would be something that is so amazingly creative that nobody ever thought about it, and I could implement it for free, or they'd pay me to implement it, and nobody would object. That's a seven, seven. Now, that's a unicorn. If you see one, beware. Uh, a one, one is something that is costly, dumb, old school, already obsolete, and we hate it, so I don't want to do that. So you can start categorizing solutions on the basis of these judgments, and then for every one of them, you can do something with it. Like, if I have a C, which is seven novelty, one feasibility, all I need to do is find out how to make it cheaper or more acceptable to the people, and then I can leverage the uh, true novelty of that and move it more to the right. So what we're discovering from the pilot program and from Angus's work with the youngsters is that there's uh, about three probable bins. There's some things that we just generally agree aren't all that surprising or very good. That's okay. Then there's some Leavenworth B things that are, hey, that's pretty interesting, and it would probably work, and we all could agree that that's a reasonable next step. But then when you get to the things that are really surprising, you begin to see a divergence. Some people think it's easily doable and acceptable. Other people disagree. In fact, when you start seeing that kind of difference of opinion, you can be sure that you've tapped into something that is very interesting and may have potential. So one of the consequences and the outputs of this research project is not just to see if we can do a two-hour lesson that measures creativity and do we get better, but to have a professional dialogue about what creativity in the profession means 
and what a profession must do with creativity in order to balance the need for certainty, risk management, accountability, yet at the same time preserve the innovations that are in creativity. When should I not use doctrine? Hey, well, how about when I have a creative idea that the enemy doesn't expect because he thinks I'm going to be doctrinal? We face that all the time. The Joint uh, Chiefs tell us that they want us on occasion to be uh, uh, outside of doctrine and insubordinate so that we can maintain surprise. That's, uh, thanks, sir. Thanks for that. How are we going to do that? We have to have a professional language that talks about creativity in sensible terms, that's grounded in evidence, that is reinforced in practice, and is looking for ways to leverage that side of the equation. We do a very good job here with critical thinking and standards and application. We need to also respect the creative side of this and then find sensible ways in which to blend this. How do you encourage lieutenants to be creative, yet at the same time increase their respect for standards and doctrine? Without, without throwing out the baby with the bathwater. That's part of the professional dialogue that we have to have that we think is going to come out of this research project as we begin to engage with large numbers. Uh, so with that in mind, I'd like to uh, open up the floor to, uh, to questions. I'm sorry to have taken so long, but I had that on my mind. Uh, so are, are there any questions from the, uh, uh, from the chat or any in the room, we're happy to talk. Over. So I'll start out with the first question while y'all are thinking of some good ones. Um, but we've mentioned a few times uh, that this treatment not only shows improvement in creativity, but also resilience. Um, and I was wondering, can this treatment be used not only to improve creativity in warfare, but also resilience in soldiers and perhaps reduce the negative impacts of our army's so-called corrosives, things like suicide? Uh, sexual harassment, et cetera. Yeah, let me throw that over to Angus because you have the widest experience with the research area and then you have some thoughts on that as well. The short answer, Chris, is yes. Um, and that's the training that we have uh, tested with the third, fourth, and fifth graders. So basically what we, what we did with the, those school age populations is we discovered that they had a high degree of what we call mental fragility. And mental fragility manifests itself that when you encounter a problem you can't solve, you either get very, very angry, uh, you give up and ask uh, uh, somebody else for help, or you express a great deal of shame. So those are the three most common emotional responses. And what we discovered uh, with these kids is that when we gave them the same treatment that um, you know uh, Ken has so eloquently described that uh, at, that uh, uh, Rich will be uh, deploying at CGSC um, this this August for for soldiers, when we gave them that exact same treatment, their resilience increased dramatically. And by dramatically, I mean that our p-values were were basically below 0 0.001, and our cone D were over one. So these are significant. Uh, major effects in resilience. And the way that manifested itself is that when kids uh, after the training did not have an answer to a question, they kept trying and they didn't give up and they didn't feel bad about themselves and they didn't feel stupid and they didn't get angry and they didn't point fingers and blame other people. Uh, they didn't look to adults for help. They just kept going. And we know that what happens in terms of resilience, in terms of its kind of mental health benefits are that it encourages a growth mindset and fundamentally, it encourages people to feel that when something very negative happened in their life, that they can find a way to repurpose that positively. And that's not the only key to bringing down suicidal ideation. I do work um, trauma and other things can obviously be huge contributors uh, uh, to suicidal ideation. I don't want to uh, suggest that somehow we can create uh, resilient soldiers who uh, can bounce back from everything. But that is a huge and, and major component. And along with its benefits, it also brings decreased anxiety and also increased interpersonal skills such as empathy and curiosity. So what you find over organizations is that people not only treat themselves more nicely, but they treat other people more nicely too. And that has this kind of knock-on effect to building these healthy societies. And again, as, as uh, Kenneth said so eloquently, we, we have documented this with, with pretty hard data. Angus just put out, and that is one of the things I, a couple of things that we've learned from this, the, the ability to collaborate with others in research. Uh, we've learned a tremendous amount. The big, the more wide the net got, the more huge lessons on research we, we 
we harvested. But the other thing is, I spent three assignments at MCTP, last as a chief observer trainer. And one of the things I heard commanders complain about constantly is the staff and my subordinate commanders are not giving me what I need. And then the question was asked, well, what do you need, sir or ma'am? And the answer usually was, I don't know, but I'll know when I see it, which is very unhelpful. But if this, like Angus says, increases um, um, empathy, that I can now not just see how I would solve something, but how somebody else might. Um, one of the things that we did a wargaming study here back in 2018 and published the results, and we've done three follow-on articles on that in Mill Review, uh, Seeing the Elephant, Connecting the Dots, uh, and uh, Seeing Through Fog. And one of the things that we talk about in there is visualization. Uh, and commanders cannot visualize by themselves. If they do, they're the only ones doing it. They've got to find meaningful ways to visualize with others, to help them help them visualize and in, interact with each other. So now I can have a chance to find out, hey, sir, ma'am, you made a choice that I didn't understand. Can you please explain the rationale? So that now we can bottle and sell that visualization, hopefully at an accelerated rate, using this technique and that's what i hope to actually saw to study next is you know when we there's going to be plenty of follow-on uh research at least with three other institutions and soft is already using this but if we can actually get people to uh imp increase their empathy we'll be able to grasp people's visualization that would be huge for us i, I think that would solve a lot of problems that you know commanders have out there because now, you know, so what I call it in seeing through fog is corporate visualization. Shared understanding is all over our doctrine, but you'll find no definition of it. We just assume we know what it is. But I argue that's a noun. It is caused by corporate visualization, which is enabled by creativity and imagination. The opposite of which is corporate blindness. And I'm sure we've all been experienced in that, seeing that. And this will help us avoid corporate blindness and enable corporate visualization. Yeah, I, uh, I want to reinforce what Angus said about uh, resilience. Uh, this is uh, consistent with the work done by Michelle Borba, B-O-R-B-A, child psychologist and, uh, and uh, educator, whose recent book, Thrivers, talks about the seven qualities of mind and character that kids who thrive under difficult circumstances seem to possess. It includes uh, self-confidence, resilience, empathy, communication skills, um, curiosity. So there's not just the individual element of creativity, it's also the social setting, the reinforcement of the tribe, what it does with your creativity in a supportive way, in a challenging way that builds a climate that favors more creativity. So we need to look beyond just the needs of the individual, but also at those interactions in our small personal groups in order to really unleash the power of what we're talking about. I know we're pushing time on this one, so I want to be respectful of that. Um, I, you have my email in the slide deck. If you're interested in collaborating or following up or getting any of your other questions answered, please send it to me. I'll get it to somebody who can answer it or I'll answer it uh, in a in in the best way I can. So uh, other questions coming in? Well, we still have 10 up? minutes left in the session. So are there any? Ten. Ten. I just add yeah. um, uh, kind of in that same vein about resiliency and empathy. I think we would be remiss to not kind of focus on how we view failure um, in our environments, in learning environments, not necessarily operational environments, but training environments. Um, where Where is failure okay? Where is it okay to take risks? Because how we react to that quote unquote failure um, does have an impact on how people will show their creativity, how comfortable they are, because a lot of, you know, somebody's willingness to put themselves out there, to put those kind of crazy unicorn ideas out there is yes, self-confidence, but also the reaction that they get from when, you know, it, oh, that will never work, or we tried it and it totally failed. Well, okay, that's fine, because sometimes failure is the best coach. But um, I think just culturally, the word failure has such a negative connotation with it that it can stifle the creativity that could emerge in environments. And so, you know, as we build empathy, as we build understanding in how others think um, and getting those 
maybe younger officers um, who are going to eventually grow into our strategic thinkers growing up in that environment, perhaps some of that will shift. In connection to the Army Leadership Requirements Model for senior leaders to be able to be emotionally vulnerable in public in order to promote a climate of uh, collaboration and mutual support. Uh, we give that a little bit of lip service. We talk about in the logic of failure you know, and in entrepreneurial thinking, fail early, fail often, fail forward, fail in order to, uh, to get better. Can we live those things and how do we create conditions whereby we, uh, we make that the norm while at the same time realizing on game day, you've got to win. So there is a, there is a duality in there that needs more attention uh, in our profession at the, at the senior uh, and managerial levels. So, Any other questions? So we have an online question, then we'll get to, to JR here. Um, John Harrington asks, he believes we started off by saying these types of exercise stimulate parts of the brain that are rarely used. Could we redesign existing problem-solving exercises and lessons, i.e. pieces of MDMP, to improve using these brain parts and ultimately improve decision making. I think that that's actually what the lesson that we are using in August does. And uh, I think that that would be an excellent follow on study for anybody who would like to do that. Uh, we do have several people in this building going after their doctorates. That would be an excellent dissertation topic. What do you think, Angus? I agree. And, you know, there's so many simple ways that you can actually engage those parts of your brain. So one that has come up, and I know that uh, Rich and I are both fans of, and that we just um, sort of got a concurrence from uh, Yusasak on, is doing planning with a piece of chalk or a pen or something else, using your hand to draw a plan, as opposed to flashing it up on a PowerPoint slide. Because the creative parts of your brain, those parts that we're talking about, are in the motor regions of the brain. And that's because creativity evolve to help you do something else. Creativity is an action response in the human brain in response to something not working. And so it gets your brain to say, what else could I do? And so by using your hands, that stimulates creativity. I mean, that's why so many arts, I mean, the word art, artisanal means done with the hands. So that's a very simple example of how we can incorporate it. But there are many, many, many other ways that we can incorporate these techniques. And one thing I do want to say is that I think a lot of this knowledge exists already in the Army. There are so many creative people in the Army. I have just had the honor and the privilege, in addition to our panelists today, of meeting individuals in and around this organization who have so many of these insights. And really what the big challenge, I think, for us is to go around and get those individuals, gather their insights up, and then have them be heard. So I think the Army actually knows a lot more of the answers to these kinds of specific problems. And as to how it improves decision making, you know, what I always like to say is um, you can only make a decision based on the plans that are on the table. So if you have two plans on the table and you have to decide between the two of them, well, your decision can only be as good as what those plans are. But creativity allows you to come up with a third plan and a fourth plan and a fifth plan and a tenth plan. And that's where the real gain comes from because it allows all these different options that you know commanders and individuals didn't previously have. They felt trapped. I either have to go left. No, you can go in any direction. Uh, my research interests center around organizational culture, commitment, and identity. I'm interested in your research design methodology. How did you settle? Um, on the dependent variables of novelty, suitability, and feasibility. And what have we learned thus far? I mean, are these covariates in any way? Or is there, I mean, I would assume like there's a negative correlation between like novelty and feasibility, for example. Sure. Yeah, it's still early days in looking at the covariance. Uh, we, we need a larger end before we can start drawing some conclusions. The reason to use those was uh, anchored in uh, my experience for doing practical research in the profession to make changes in the real world. And that is when you propose to make a change in the profession, you must respect their best practices and show how that got you to the recommendation that you want. So we use the criteria of suitable, feasible, acceptable all the time in force management when evaluating 
uh, JSIDS gaps and Gottmo PF solutions and PPBE recommendations, but we also use that same language with a little bit of difference in meaning in course of action development and decision making. So by anchoring our uh, discussions and our variables into the profession's existing language, then we're able, I think, to leverage it out into, into the uh, language of creativity. There was a question there about the use of um, uh, motor circuits in the brain uh, that are already kind of well activated. And I think Angus's point about how the, uh, the, the, the peripersonal space is what the psychologists call it in cognitive neuroscience, is that that space out to the limits of your eyeballs or the reach of your hands uh, is very strongly connected to your visual cortex, your motor neurons, and the imagination to solve problems in real time that are close to you. We've inherited those pieces. When you don't use those kinesthetic features and you reduce problem solving to an analytical exercise, and maybe you neglect the wordplay because it's soft and squishy, or you maybe undervalue kinesthetic knowledge, uh, you are relying only on uh, a subset of the brain's uh, capabilities to solve problems. So uh, the use of storytelling and alternate futures and visualization also is connecting to some of those um, those like rehearsal genes, if I can say it that way, or imagining the ball going into the hoop when you rehearse. So that's how we think uh, this is connecting to some uh, to some of the other circuits in the brain. Well, Over. one thing I'd do is just add to that. Some of the stuff that both Ken and, and Angus are talking about also works very well with design, right? The whole process of reframing. I mean, Angus just described reframing when we're doing, hey, this is my first plan, second plan, 10th plan. That's all reframing. So an example of this, I always take my students through, hey, uh, you got the most dangerous and the most likely course of action that the enemy's going to do. Now, we know by doctrine that's not, that's not all we're supposed to consider. We're supposed to imagine the range of possibilities. The problem is, is what if our left and right barber poles are completely out of whack? And it's really something over here, over there, back there, or up there. That's what we're trying to get at. Some way to encourage reframing that takes into consideration counterfactual futures, many of which, and one of the things that's incorporated into our lesson is a discussion of 1903, the chief of the engineers of the Navy thought that flight, man flight was impossible. Three years later, guess what happens? Kitty Hawk and the Wright brothers. So um, that is a counterfactual future. Look at how much stuff has changed in our lives uh, that, that couldn't have been thought possible. And now there, it's happening what might be possible in, in 10 years. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Nye with the Army Research Institute, and I had a question about creative collaborations. Um, I'm overseeing a project on creative collaborations because, and the reason I brought this up was the conversation about novelty and feasibility. And one of the things that we've noticed um, in, not just in the Army, but in business in general, is that it's very often for leaders to shut down an early idea because early ideas are usually bad because they're malformed, they're not ready yet. But the early idea has a has a goal, has a piece of gold in there. It just needs to be formed and refined and found. And um, there's this idea in creative cooperation literature that um, no, there's almost no sole creative genius. And I was uh, because what usually happens is it's a team of individuals who refine and who refine an idea. And I wanted to hear, first, I'd love to just follow up and have a conversation with this, but also how have you noticed individual training in this that influences not just how someone evaluates their own ideas, but evaluates other ideas too? Right, so we, Ken and I are associated with the Association of Business Simulations and Experiential Learning. And uh, I've uh, published with them now three times, um, but, Basically, I was worried that when I went there and started giving my ideas, are they going to go, you know, there's a lot of academians and people from business. They go, you're just one of those military weirdos. And I discovered they really want to work with us. They're very curious about, and when you tell a business person, hey, I've, I've come up with a way to anticipate future states, right? The, you know, I tell my students when they show up here, hey, guess what? Uh, if, if you didn't do it before now, you have to do it now. Your job in the future is to predict the future. That's it. Now, you may think that that's un unfortunate and unfair, but it's the job. Your boss will need to know what's coming next or at least have a decent hypothesis. Okay, so, yeah, I'd love to have a conversation uh, 
the diversity of our collaborations is has what's really enabled this to become what it is. And uh, you know, being the principal investor for nine researchers is not easy, but it. And, and I told my wife after I did it the first time that I'd never do it again, and here I am again doing it a third time and a fourth time because I'm also doing a study on writing improvement. So, so we got about a minute left, so let me give you 30 seconds. So the IDEO case study that examines the collaborative team-based approach to innovation, which is creativity that can also pay off, reinforces your point about social development of create ideas as opposed to a Lone Ranger. Uh, our, what's coming out of our study also is that when you consider suitable, feasible, acceptable as the Army's evaluation criteria, that the same idea can get judged very differently by three different headquarters because of their time horizon. A division commander is not concerned about novelty. He must have solutions that work today and the next two years, suitable and feasible. Those are what are acceptable. He doesn't need novelty for its own sake. He has to have reliability and readiness that is a clear advantage. So he would weight uh, suitability much and feasibility much higher. If you go out to Futures Command, where I have 10 years in order to bring a product to market, all I really need is novelty. Because if it's truly novel, I have 10 years to find a way to produce it economically and change the culture to make it acceptable for values. So same idea is perfect for Futures Command, whereas it's not really acceptable to a division commander. Now, if you're a G staff and you're in the middle and you're working in the program, you need to balance novelty, suitable, feasible, and acceptable, because you have to have it novel enough that it's a clear advantage in three to five years, but also feasible and acceptable enough so that I can use limited resources and get the bang for the buck, because I have a limitation on what I can fund. So an additional insight that comes out of our research already is that by understanding the time dimensions of the decision maker, you are more likely to get a different kind of a response and that the profession needs to not throw away novel ideas, but to make sure that we can access them in the correct time frame and in order to preserve the genuine novelty. So that's what we're seeing in a large organization, large budget with multiple time horizons. Over. So we're, we have about zero seconds left. So we want to thank you very much for, yes. for being in here and uh, uh, use Chris Baldwin and I as Command Central for connecting with anybody you'd like to collaborate with, or if you have additional questions, we'll answer them. And uh, Chris will answer them in writing, and we'll get you. Uh, we would love to continue to collaborate with you because it beats working. Yep. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for being here and uh, and looking forward to work with you in the future. Yep. And I know we're getting close to saying goodbye. So thanks, Angus. Thanks, Angus. Thanks, thanks a lot. Wonderful to meet. Thank you. Thank you.